but no. Uh, my name's Brent Liebeck. I've uh, been a member of actually PGI before we were bought by India. I've held a few different positions and I just anymore consider myself just a part of the NVIDIA HPC SDK. So I'm gonna kind of take a step back. You've heard of you know, a good introduction from Jeff and we're gonna talk a little bit about the considerations you need to take when you're in the, met in the process of porting your code from a CPU to a GPU. And uh, I'm assuming that there are some people here who will just get started with this process on Perlmutter. And so just to kind of think of the way to think about GPU computing, uh, which applies to all of the programming models and languages that we've talked about. So uh, Jeff showed this slide. Uh, this is the HPC SDK from a high level view. I'm not gonna go over this too much, um, but uh, it has the, the various compilers and programming models. But uh, for this section right now, we're gonna talk a little bit about porting considerations. So I've given these talks for 12 years or so. Uh, so from about five years ago, when uh, the Coral systems were first introduced, we used to show this slide. And this on the left is the uh, uh, CPU, whether it's an x86 power or ARM. And it's got you know uh, a handful of, of cores. That's probably more cores now than it was five years ago, but maybe they've doubled to 40 or 64, something like that. Sorry to interrupt, Brent. Um, people yeah. reporting sound become choppy, so I think it's okay. Let me turn, turn off. Turn it off. off. Yeah. Let's see if this is better. Um, the CPU is, is connected to uh, usually large, high capacity memory. Any more? This is you know half a terabyte or a terabyte of memory on a server class system. Uh, relatively uh, to the GPU, the memory bandwidth between the CPU cores and its memory is fairly low. Uh, you know, I've been around this uh, uh, industry for quite a while. And in fact, I wrote a paper in 2007 or eight with some people at Sandia when multi-core was first coming out about how the, uh, the memory bandwidth was not keeping up uh, with the number of CPU cores. So on the right, we have a typical GPU accelerator. So it's got many more cores. Uh, you know, every generation seems to like double the number of, of uh, GPU cores on the accelerator. It's got a relatively small shared cache and a smaller uh, main memory, GPU device memory, but the bandwidth to that memory is much, much higher. So uh, with more cores, the cores are simpler. And as we'll talk about some of the considerations, the key is not to just fill up the number of cores on the accelerator, but to way oversubscribe them. So you can in fact hide some of the memory uh, latency and take advantage of the high memory bandwidth. Now between the two, there is a, a interconnect, either PCI or NVLink on the, the Coral-based machines. And that is yet another consideration that we'll talk about over the course of the next two days of how to minimize the amount of traffic across that connection between the CPU and G. So processor counts through the years now. So notice in the upper uh, left-hand corner, there's a little circle, a blue circle. So, uh, you know, when some of us started uh, in HPC, uh, most of the parallelism was via MPA. You wrote pretty much a sequential program. Uh, at points, you inserted MPI sends and MPI receives into your code. 
the core may have been like a 486 or a, maybe an SGI uh, processor or maybe even a Sun Ultra Spark processor. Uh, so there were, you know, a few uh, uh, registers. It had some instruction level parallelism. Uh, the clock seemed to get faster and faster with every generation. And as the CPUs became more and more complicated, uh, our ability to write software really improved. And we added, started adding a lot of new features and ideas to the programming language. So features like dynamic memory allocation, larger heaps, larger stacks, the, just the amount of stuff in your node was really increasing at a very high level, high rate, I should say. So then, you know, SIMD hardware came along, like SSE registers, AVX registers. So how did we uh, uh, adjust to these changes? Well. We still used high-level parallelism via MPI. It seemed to be a great model, and it's survived over many, many years. Uh, we got in, most of our performance improvements still via the manufacturing process improvements. Uh, instruction level parallelism got even higher. There were more registers. The clocks were still faster. And at this point, uh, SIMD vectorization of loops became important, and compilers including the old PGI compiler, which I, where I worked, you know, really invested a lot of time and effort into vectorizing loops across uh, SIMD lanes. Uh, so the compilers weren't perfect. Some programs resorted to SIMD instructions. But you still coded. Sorry, um, Brent. Sure. Uh, Jennifer again, um, you're supposed to show some diagrams. Um, we're only seeing texts on the screen right now. Do you see anything on the left-hand side? Just uh, four dots. That's all there's there. <laughs> okay, so okay. <laughs> I thought maybe you have more diagrams to show. Okay. Thanks. I will. So I am showing how <clears throat> the processor counts have uh, grown over the generations. So we still code to the main core and the sequencer, right? So you have a sequencer that has branches and loops and things. Now, even though you have, uh, say, four lanes in your SIMD uh, registers, uh, you use SIMD loads and stores on those. You don't write code for each individual lane. And that's kind of the uh, CPU model. So then we moved to multi-core architecture. So this was maybe 15 years ago, AMD launched uh, uh, the hammer. <laughs> I was thinking of the kind of the slime name, the hammer, AMD 64 architecture. So then people decided and started to use MPI plus OpenMP. So maybe I used MPI one per core, but maybe I used one MPI process and, and OpenMP. And this was about the time that the clock rates really began to slow. You know, we had hit maybe three gigahertz. And then, you know, that was kind of the, the top end on, on uh, x86. They actually started to slow down, but they added more cores. So then NUMA issues began to crop up. Uh, NUMA P threads made their way into the Linux kernel. Uh, I remember how disruptive that was. Uh, the memory bandwidth, again, does not keep up with the compute speed. Uh, the main memory got bigger, uh, but perhaps you only had about two gigabytes per core on your, on your uh, server, but they added more and more caches to each core. So uh, if you... Uh, to deal with the latency to main memory, they added more cache. And then we moved to AVX 512. And so this is maybe like Cori GPU. Um, again, a lot of the same things as before, but just more and better. Uh, AVX 512 hardware was actually a little slow to take hold. And the initial implementations were not optimal lots of times uh, we found in our compiler, 
it was better to generate code for AVX 256, uh, assuming that every core was going to be active. It had a uh, heat or, or power issues. Uh, still NUMA issues. Vectorizing compilers are still very important. SIMD instructions still in use. Uh, and just more and more uh, of the same types of things. Software grows in complexity, relies on features like dynamic memory, large heaps, large data, big long call stacks. Uh, of course, you still coded to the main core and sequencer. You did 512 you know, bit loads and stores, but usually just one sequence. So this is Ampere A100. And maybe this might even be an underrepresentation of the number of cores in an A100. So um, this, is, this is what you're faced with if you've been running on an AVX 512 CPU, and now you're moving your code to Ampere. So you need to find much more parallelism in your code uh, when you move this to the GPU. Otherwise, you'll be under underutilizing the GPU. So you know, 40 different threads are just not enough, or 64 different threads, you know, times eight even is just not enough. Uh, an Ampere A100 likes to work on thousands, tens of thousands of different elements all at the same time. So some of the Ampere hardware characteristics. Um, so we can still use high level parallelism via MPA and perhaps OpenMP. Now there's been a lot of applications ported over the years to GPUs that still use OpenMP, maybe one thread per uh, GPU. And in fact, some well-known applications uh, are only open MP, one thread per GPU. And then if you don't have enough GPUs, all the threads kind of help out, do some work sharing, and they have uh, schedulers built into them. So because the, the GPU is so large, uh, there are some tricks or ideas you can use to like make multiple uses of the GPU. So we'll talk about some of these things, multiple CUDA contexts, multiple streams running in parallel. There's MIG and MPS, which are some you know, products provided by NVIDIA, which allow sharing uh, the GPU resources, uh, either within your program or with other people, you know, other entities. Um, on a GPU, synchronization between the columns in this diagram uh, is hard. Synchronization down the column is a feature of CUDA that's been there forever, and you sync all the uh, threads in a single block. Uh, I say it's hard, but it is solvable, and, and a lot of clever people have solved it, uh, but it's usually buried into a library. It's not really as as much a part of the programming model. So uh, if you need to do synchronization between the thread blocks or the columns in this diagram, uh, you'll struggle to find a, a good solution. For that. And it turns out offloading compilers are very important. Uh, kernel scheduling, tuning, and flexibility of launch parameters is key. People spend quite a bit of time working on that. And we'll go over some examples of how you do that in some of the various programming models over the next two days. <clears throat> Memory bandwidth is many times higher than a CPU. So a number we've thrown out for years and years is like 6x. And I don't, I don't know for sure that that still holds. It's usually somewhere between 5 and 10x with each generation. Uh, the bandwidth number between a GPU and a CPU. The memory latency is very high, and the caches on a GPU are relatively small. Now, the caches on a GPU have gotten better and better with every generation, but still they are much smaller than on a CPU. And every once in a while, we run into applications that run faster on a 
multi-core CPU than on a GPU. And it's usually because on a multi-core CPU, the whole data set fits in like L1 cache. And so uh, you will not see a lot of speed up if your data sets are that small. <clears throat> there is a shared memory, which uh, Jeff, I think, touched on. So it is a programmer managed cache and it's useful for performance and to communicate between cores in an SM or in the column within a thread block in a column on the diagram. And massively oversubscribing the cores is a key to performance. So I don't know, they may say an A100 has 5,000 CUDA cores in it, uh, but you know, if you can launch 25,000 units of work uh, you'll be you'll see a lot better performance than if you can only launch five thousand units of work. On there. What uh, what you have on a GPU is almost instantaneous, like one cycle context switches. So the context switches are much much faster on a GPU than on a CPU. So that is why oversubscribing is really helpful in getting uh, GPU performance. Uh, CUDA is a lot different and it was, you know, I've been around a long time. It was kind of the first model where you coded to the core or the lane. And so the CUDA runtime that's on the GPU handles the divergence, even though, you know, all the, the cores in a column in the diagram might run in lockstep. You can say something like, if I'm thread number four, go off and do something else. Uh, and you don't do that on a, on a CPU with SIMD lanes, but you can do that in CUDA and that ability kind of trickles up into the other programming models. So there's a cost, uh, there's a, you know, uh, cost in performance, but the CUDA runtime that runs on the GPU just handles that. Uh, each core lane loads and stores its own data, uh, and the OS or the low level runtime ideally coalesces those into contiguous blocks. I've found over the years, the biggest uh, factor in GPU performance is getting all the cores in a thread block, like a column of the dots on the diagram to read consecutive memory locations in memory. The bandwidth that you see is just factors higher if you do that than if you read sort of random data or across uh, a matrix rather than, you know, contiguous. In a matrix. <clears throat> and other programming considerations, each core or lane has a very small stack compared to the CPU and a limited number of registers compared to a CPU core. So, uh, you, you may have OpenMP code that goes parallel and has, you know, big functions that run on the CPU cores and long call stacks and generates a lot of local data. You're gonna have trouble with that on a GPU. So uh, a lot of work has gone into applications over the years that are ported to the GPU to change that type of program. And finally, this is one of the things that I always tell people, overheads can really adversely affect the performance. So the GPU programming is a kernel-based programming model. You launch kernels, they're short-lived, and then the kernel ends, and then you launch another kernel, the kernel ends, and Every thread in every CUDA thread that's doing work may only work on one or two elements or just a handful of elements of the bigger problem. So unfortunately, if you have overhead like indirect memory accesses or other you know, function calls where you have to set up uh, argument lists and then tear down argument lists, things like that, that can actually take longer 
for a thread than doing the actual work. So you need to think about how can I just simplify my kernels that I'm launching to do kind of the minimal amount of extra stuff. And where I always harp on this for people is, is in uh, high level Fortran that passes things by using descriptors or creates temp arrays or things like that. Uh, just try to remove those from your code in any model when you're moving uh, code to the team. I'm gonna wrap up here, uh, general recommendations. Uh, so there are lots of, of tuning guides, uh, literature, books on uh, moving to GPUs. And whether you're using CUDA, OpenMP, OpenACC, or higher level standard PAR languages, uh, these all uh, follow, you know, follow the same guidelines. So look for the CUDA C++ programming guide, CUDA C++ best practices guide. It, the stuff that they talk about applies to all models. So, you know, find ways if you can to parallelize sequential code minimize the data transfers between the host and the device, kind of back to that original diagram, either, you know, if it's NVLink or PCI. So a lot of times you will run a, multiple, a large number of time steps on the GPU. You need to think about minimizing the updates that have to go back to the host at each time step and the new updates that have to go back to the GPU at each time. Uh, at the beginning, of your runs or the end of the runs, there's really not much you can do, but at each time step, you can really try to minimize. Uh, adjust the kernel launch configuration. You may know more about the, uh, you know, loop extents, the size of each dimension of your arrays than the compiler ever does. You can play around with the launch configurations in CUDA, the number of blocks, the number of threads per block, um, ensure global memory accesses are coalesced. I talked about that. So within a warp or a thread block, you want all of the threads to be accessing consecutive uh, elements of memory. The, you know, internally, the GPU has a very wide memory bus. And if you access uh, consecutive areas, you take advantage of that wide memory. Uh, minimize redundant accesses to global memory. Um, you know, GPUs do have some caches on them, small L1 and a small L2, uh, but you don't want to be doing a lot of extra reads and writes. And avoid long sequences of diverged execution by threads within the same warp. So I don't really see this as, as much of a problem, usually because of the problems I'm working on. So finally, you've seen this slide. I just want to reiterate one more time. Everything that I've talked about in this presentation applies to all three of these columns. Whether you're using uh, do concurrent, uh, standard R and C++, directive-based models, the way you form your loops and the way the accesses are done in the innermost loop are very important. And uh, I think that's all 